Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Think Your Way to an Epic Life. And today's episode is really fun for me. We're going to grow. We're going to learn a lot. Um, Dan Cravens has been a friend of him and his wife have been friends of my husband and I for years and years and years. And he's got an amazing story to tell. He's one of the most genuine, real people that you'll ever have the opportunity to meet. Thank you so much for joining me, Dan. You're welcome, Kara. Glad to be here. Good to have you. So the, uh, this is called Think Your Way to an Epic Life. Okay. And um, the way I see it, you have helped teach me how to have a much more epic life. Dan has been kind of a mentor to me business-wise for quite some time, and you have changed my life drastically. Tell me how it all started for you. From the beginning. From the beginning. Okay. Well, I'll tell you. So we, I was born here in Albuquerque, and uh, we lived in town till I was probably fourth, maybe fourth grade, I think, fourth, fifth grade. And then we moved out to the mountains, to the East Mountains. And... Um, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, I like the East Mountains. I realized that that being the, that whole country atmosphere and being in the mountains was part of me and uh, didn't know, you know, until you got over how big of a part it is. But during those years, it was definitely part of me. And I can remember just, I can't tell you how many walks and still continue to take all over the East Mountains. Hikes, long, long hikes, eight hours, nine hours, two hours, whatever. So... Uh, so anyway, it probably started there, then went to uh, elementary there, Roosevelt, or excuse me, Montoya, then to Roosevelt, then to Manzano, then I had a final stretch at uh, Nimi. That's the whole story within itself. But uh, then I went from there to um, Fort Lewis College, Colorado State University, and then graduate school at New Mexico State University. Okay, so graduate school got you what? A master's in geology. Okay. So, uh, and then worked all kinds of different places uh, in, in the geology business. Uh, you know, it's a feast or famine business. And I went right in, went to an engineering firm here in town called Leeds Hill Herkenhoff when I was right out of college. And uh, that was a good start uh, there uh, just to kind of get plugged into the business. It's kind of a hard business to get plugged into. But once I got plugged in, it was, it was great. And I stayed there for a few years and... And you have to travel periodically. You know, I'd go to Phoenix, um, Texas, Colorado, a little bit in Utah during those years. But uh, so in probably the biggest, uh, like, real nice change for me was when I was asked to go to work at the cement plant. So when I was, that's how I put myself through college, was I worked at the cement, Ideal Cement Plant. And it was a tough job. Nobody wanted these jobs. It was, they called this one uh, the seventh floor. And uh, it was, you know, hot clinker came from the bottom floor to an elevator. And it rolled off there hot. And it, that, was, that was back in, like, pre-health and safety days. <laughs> right. So was, and there was no OSHA. <laughs> I mean, it, it, well, there was, there was a somewhat of a safety. But it, it was, I mean, we shoveled hot clinker onto a conveyor belt eight hours a day. Woo. And it was hot. And uh, then sometimes we'd get... An easy job. We just shoveled lime that came off of the conveyor belt on the conveyor belt. Well, but the bottom line is I got paid great wages, so it got me through school. Well, <laughs> one time, uh, I'll never forget, I was at, uh, actually, I started out at UNM, and I was at UNM, and, and I didn't, I didn't, I wanted to be in more of an ag type school versus UNM, and so uh, I wasn't really doing that good, and so I had a buddy named Britt Wilson, and at the time, Britt was playing basketball for UNM, and they were in the—I think they were in the top four that year, collegiate basketball in the nation. It was just a wow. really good team they had. And I'll never forget sitting at the student union building with a Britt. And I said, "Britt, how are you doing in school?" And he goes, "I'm doing C's and B's." And how are you? He says, "How are you doing, Dan?" I go, "I'm pretty solid D's and F's." And so, <laughs> anyway, I thought I'm getting out of here. So I, we, Britt and I, sold everything we had and. And I went to Australia, hitchhiked around Australia, and, uh, New Zealand, Fiji, Samoa, and just lived off whatever we could out of backpacks and that kind of thing. And Wait a minute, how long did you do that? Oh, I don't, just a few months, not oh long. Oh my gosh, what an experience. But we were young, and it was fun. It was well, I'm sorry to stop you, but what, what age were you? 19. Would you recommend that 19-year-olds that don't have a family and don't have the responsibilities go do that now? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. No regrets. No. Now, you learn more about life 
just getting out of your environment and just seeing, seeing life. And there's all kinds of different aspects of life. So, yeah, yeah I'd highly recommend that. Highly yeah. recommend it. And, uh, and also just working your way. You know, you did, did whatever. I mean, we worked on um, digging ditches. Britt worked on a water buffalo ranch. Uh, <laughs> I, I worked with sheep. Um, loading cattle hides onto trucks. Um, just, um, just doing cleanups for this helicopter pad. We lived out in the middle of nowhere on this pad. There was no running water. Or anything. We just lived there. Anyway, yeah, I would, I'd highly recommend that. And then from... From that point in time, then I went back to school at Fort Lewis for a couple of years, and then uh, same kind of thing. An advisor says I wanted to get into veterinary school, and he says, "Well, um, you know, your grades are pretty bad, and you really don't have a snowball's chance of hell of getting into veterinary school." So <laughs> I thought, "You're no kind of advisor, you know." <laughs> so, but anyway, he was right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I went to. Uh, so I kind of veered away from veterinary school and I got into geology and ended up being a geologist and that that was a good move so I went and, and in that business you kind of have to have a master's so I went to graduate school and got a master's and then got out of and then getting back to how I kind of got started was um, when I was in graduate school there was uh, pe- two, two old uh, Spanish elderly couple up at a place called Susie's Cafe in Taos Junction. And I'll never forget, I had a job in graduate school measuring heat flow out of wells. And so I was looking all over for, you know, areas where the magma came up closer to the surface and we can measure this heat, measure this heat flow. And it was, it was at that time the geothermal funding was huge in DOE. And so I did that. And um, anyway, I went into this and I, they met with me in, the, in their little cafe. Went back there and the, the lady, uh, the man, well, they were really nice folks. She just started bursting out crying, and I felt so bad, and I thought, I'm so sorry, I'll, I'll leave. I didn't know this was good. I'm just trying to get through graduate school, and he said, the man said, no, no. He says, what happened was uh, we drilled one hole 900 feet, and it was dry, and the guy said, well, we just accidentally crossed a fault, so we drew, moved it over five feet and drilled another dry 900-foot hole. Oh, no. And so they lost their whole life savings. Mm. And I thought at that point in time, man, I'm going to go into something that can help these kind of people not yet taken. So I started doing that all over the East Mountains. And I bet I looked at thousands of locations geologically. And then I started, um, you know, looking for these people and, and showing them. I wouldn't show them work. I'd say, okay, this is or isn't going to work. I'd just say, here's the geology. Here's what makes, you know, groundwater. Here's where you should drill. And, and we just, I did that for a long time. And I, Started that little company. Matter of fact, I still have that company. It's been 30-some-odd 30, 30 years. I still have that little company. Can, can I ask you, yeah. what do you think about water witchers? Well, I, you know, I personally like using geology. Uh, I've seen some crazy water witching kind of things going on before, and I don't dislike them. I've got friends that do that. And um, <laughs> I'll tell you another funny story. <laughs> so, my, so I don't believe in them that much. Okay. That's really what I wanted to know. So I, but here's what happened. This, this is going to sound crazy. I was doing a job and I just got married to Pam and we had just had a little baby. And I, at that time I worked seven days a week. Pam made me not work on Sundays. Good so, because it'd be better for the family. And it was, it was better for me too, but I always worked. And so, but that day I said, we've got to go finish this project. We'll go over there and have a picnic after church and it won't be work. It'll be sort of a picnic. And so we brought... I think Daniel was just a little baby in, in a, on a blanket. And I walked this property with this guy. I was dating down in South 14, and he was in these limestones. And I was walking the property, and, and I looked at it. We spent three or four hours, and I finally found an area that, okay, I think this is here. The fault goes here. The drainage is here. The recharge is there. If, you, if the uplift should be here, if you drill over here, this, but, you know, this is a good spot. And he goes over. He turns over a uh, rock and there's a, there's a dot on it a mark and i go he goes what what do you think about this and i go well there's all kinds of people up here doing ritual type stuff you know you can get marks on the rocks you never know you know people and he goes no no i put that there and i go what and he goes i know i know you don't believe in water witchers and i said well you're right there and he says but i wanted to show you so he literally had gone maybe he dotted them all well, he did. He did. Yeah, he dotted the one. And then, so anyway, he brings this peach branch. 
that he got at his grandma's house in the in the North Valley. Brings it out, and I know that's going to sound stupid, and I walked perpendicular across that thing, and that peach branch turned in my hand, and that sounds way off base, and that's to a guy that doesn't believe in this thing, but that did happen. So, and that's how he found that location. So, I don't so, know so, what to so do. So, is this. it possible? That my 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 rule eighty twenty, mm-hmm. right? Eighty percent of any profession is pretty bad at it, but twenty percent is really good. That most water witches are in the eighty percent, and that's why oh. you don't believe in it. Is <laughs> well, I don't see the science behind it. That's all. Oh, okay. I just don't see the science behind it, okay. and so I just couldn't. I can't understand it. There is a little bit has to do with. Um, like when these guys use these bent rods to find water lines. I mean, I can see the science behind that, but I couldn't see it. But um, but there it was, you know. Okay. So uh, anyway, I started doing that, and I started thinking, well, I can do this on my own. So I started going rounding up properties, and saying, telling the owner, I'll I'll take this property, and if you'll give me a real estate contract, I'll buy this because I don't have any money. But I'll then line up a driller. Okay, if you'll come drill this, we'll. You know, he'll get a certain chunk, and I'll get these ones. And, and make, make a long story short, one, I would divide it in four. In, back then, you could divide it in four pieces without having a 50-foot-wide county road to it. And I would do that. And uh, and I did I did that for a long time. And then I started, and then sell them on contracts. And then I got, um, got to where uh, I would try to get these properties, and the brokers would buy them out from underneath me. So then I went and got my real estate broker's license so that that wouldn't happen. And so uh, anyway, that that worked out. And, and you they, still have that company. And I still have the, the broker's license and, yeah, uh, the real estate. And uh, then I started, uh, so anyway, I just, one thing led to the other. And most of the time, most of the time I've had, I guess about half of my career I've worked for myself and half of it I've worked for somebody else. But most of the time, especially when the babies are little, it was a full-time job that, had a steady paycheck with insurance and health and all that. Sure. But, um, and then I started, you know, developing land and uh, building, gosh, a car washes, door shed, buildings, everything. And just one thing leads to another, especially in real estate. And especially if you're uh, born broke and poor, I mean, you're trying to get a hold of everything. Right. And so, which I did. I just tried, tried it. And a lot of mistakes, a billion mistakes. And then suddenly you start to, realize the patterns of here's what you do and you know here's how you alleviate those mistakes but uh one time into particular about this 2008 and 9 issue that happened i don't remember those years oh yes sir <laughs> well we i had so much stuff going on and i couldn't i can tell you how fast things were going downhill and one of my kids got sick and i had to mortgage everything and sell this sell that try to pay for just keep keep us afloat and uh anyway i'll never forget Going to uh, so it's not always good. It's not always roses when you're making your own way. That's what my, that's my point. But you just stay after it. You just keep persevering. Try to stay out of debt and stay after it. So I'll never forget. I go to a good buddy of mine who was an elder at our church, and uh, I, and so with me. Oh, no, I was an elder. He wasn't at that time, but he had been for many many years before. His name is Marvin Proctor, and he was. I I thought the world of Marvin. And I know you do too. Yes. And I sat down with Marvin. I go, Marvin, uh, I don't know what to do. I said, I've just pretty much, uh, I'm at wit's end. I, you know, barely holding on. He goes, and I said, and all I have is this job in Australia as a geologist. But if I go down there, you know, the climate's good. The, you know, place for my son to breathe better is good. And so we're going to go to, I guess, I don't know what to do. And Marvin says, well, have you prayed about it? I said, yeah, I prayed about it. He goes, well, then that's your answer. And I thought, hmm. So I went home, told Pam, I said, I think we're going to go to Gold Australia. And she about fell apart. You know, she didn't want to leave. She loved Cedar Crest, loved her home. And so I've never forget. <laughs> so, uh, we, you know, I, I put him with a headhunter. First point of life, I put him with a headhunter overseas. And they found that job. So anyway, I went ahead and accepted it. And then I'll never forget to go in. I had a globe or a map in my office. And my son put a little line on there to Perth. And he put it around the globe, and he says, Dad, this Perth, Australia, is the farthest place from Albuquerque there is on the face of the earth. He goes, I go, well, <laughs> that's where we're going. So uh, anyway, they sent me over there for six months before Pam and the kids came out. And uh, so we went out there, and uh, this is kind of the reason I'm telling this story. is kind of a beautiful ending here. But 
when I was over there working, I was excited because, okay, we were able to pay our bills. Uh, Pam could come out. We leased our house out. We didn't lose anything. We almost did, you know, weeks from losing everything like everybody else during that time. Got out there, held on. Pam flies out. She's only out there about two or three weeks. And I'd lived in this apartment. They were with me, and we were switching apartments and moving into a house, but our furniture was a week or two late coming. So we were staying on basically cots and blankets in there until the furniture came. Well, Pam and I go to the flea market. Uh, we always oh, rented a different house over there. Pam and I go to the flea market. And uh, she walks up to me and she says, I go, Pam, this is great. You're going to love this, Perth. You know, it's on the Mediterranean style climate. It's a great place. She walks up and she, to me and she goes, Dan, what I really want to say. Dan, what I really want to say. Dan, what I really want to say. And I go, honey, that, nothing's that important. Just settle down. Dan, what I really want And then she has a... Uh, uh, seizure it falls down grand mal seizure grand mal seizure and it was so bad I mean I didn't know it no had even called 911 and fortunately an Australian gal there did but I remember putting my fingers in her mouth because she was biting her tongue in half and so I put it in there and, and finally got it to where she was breathing she finally came back around ambulance came they put us in the ambulance I'm trying to hold her and she think doesn't know who I am she's strapped down and uh, we're on our way to, uh, to the hospital. I didn't know where we were heading. We were just heading somewhere. And so uh, I go, well, asking her about things. Well, what do you think of this? And she's looking at me like, what? Are you, who are you? And then I go, well, do you want this? And, no. You want this? I go, you want to go back home to Cedar Crest? And she goes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, you know, I, that's where she loved here. She yes. wanted to be home. Yes. But we couldn't afford to stay home. And so and it, was just, it was just an opportunity. And so anyway, we go over there and, and uh, take her in the room there and, and, uh, at, the, at the hospital. And it just so happens this part of Australia was the, uh, Perth, Australia is the number one uh, brain trauma treatment center in the, in the southern hemisphere, 10 minutes from the house. And back here, the insurance company had dropped us. I'd paid all my bills. They had dropped us because they said you'd just turn in too many claims on your one son. So... Anyway, we get over there, they had paid for everything. Australian, it's a job I'd had paid for everything. So we're in there, and they have Pam. They put, go into a CAT scan, and sure enough, there's something about the size of a, about the size of an egg. And the person that was reading that CAT scan came up with me, and she was, oh, oh, I can't believe, but this is not good. you got to talk to the doctor. Go back out with your wife. And anyway, uh, sure enough, it was a huge tumor in her brain. And the doctor came out and talked to us. And I'm over there talking with Pam. I said, I don't know what's wrong, honey, but she'd come to by that time, just laying in the bed. Doctor comes out. She says, I don't know if you got two hours, one week, a month, but we've got to get this tumor out of here. So they take her, take us to what's called the Royal Perth Hospital, which was the center for this in, the, in basically the world. Wow. And we get over there, and they look at it, Two or three days later, they said, we've got to pull it out. So me and the kids had gone over there. Okay, we're going to shave our head because mom's going to get her. And she's got beautiful hair, she gorgeous does. hair. And a doctor said, came in, we were all ready to do that. No, no, you don't have to do that. We'll make an incision. She'll keep all her hair. Three days, pull it out. It was the size of an orange. And pull it out. And uh, during this whole whole time, you know, I'm corresponding back and forth to the church. And Ivina Rutledge, who is a very close friend of ours, you know, she's... She really helped me when I was a kid. The first time I ever went to church was one time to a vi vacation Bible school. Me, Bible school meant just one more school while you're out of school. doesn't make sense. And this is summertime. I'm not ready to go to school. But anyway, Ivina, they had these arts and crafts things, and I didn't have any money for the a leather Bible cover that she was teaching us how to make, so she paid for it. And I made those. And matter of fact, Joe took, took me in. They had a potluck, and I said, man, I don't have any money for this potluck. And he said, no, no, no. We do this because this is how Jesus Christ did it for us. And he made, he explained that whole issue of Jesus Christ to me. And I started to get the hang, man, these people love each other. And I, it's more than I ever had as a kid. Yeah. You know, we never had that in our family. It was very traumatic, you know, very traumatic upbringing. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So, um, anyway, getting back to the story, I was back emailing Ivina. Well, Ivina gets a prayer chain at church, which you were a part of. Mm -hmm. And everybody at church was having prayers for Pam. And I'd because I'd sent these emails all out to everybody, somehow this kindergarten, no, it's first grade in Oklahoma, 
had got these emails and they said, well, we they sent back an email to me. We don't know us, but we are such and such a class. We're Mrs. Such and such kindergarten or first grade class. And we put our hand up on a map for, in Australia. We prayed for the lady in Australia. And they said, with a chicken egg in her head. <laughs> so, so it was so cute. But Pam said she literally felt those blessings. Well, to make a long story short, Pam came through it. When she got out of it, she really had a hard time figuring out where she was. And it was so nice because my kids were there helping her. You know, if you'd have had that here, she'd have been, you know, entertaining company and visitors so much that she couldn't have got healthy. Well, it took her the full two years to get healthy down there, which was great because it gave her time to heal. And uh, if I wouldn't have gone with Marvin and asked about that prayer, and we wouldn't have gone to Australia, we would have never had the blessings of her getting through that. Plus, the job I had down there was, I mean, I couldn't believe they were paying me to do it. It was so much fun. I saw so many parts of Australia out of a helicopter, out of a Jeep, out of a, you know, a jetliner, all of it. And uh, anyway, that, that's just, so I guess getting back to that, that one particular example of, I would say, you talked about success. I would say what makes success is over all these years, you know, and I wasn't taught any of it. It just self-learned all of it but I would say that you stay the course you I mean it sounds elementary but you try to follow the ancient words of the Bible try to do what Christ said in the New Testament you know love each other do things right um, you know follow a follow a path follow a framework and keep working I even tell my kids this this day no matter what if you're working on your bike for yourself or for somebody, you put in 40, 45 hours a week. If you accidentally miss something, you work over a Saturday. Pretty soon you'll learn you're going to work that Monday through Friday. You're not going to play around. And they're, they're good about that. You know, they're good about doing that. And, uh, but I would say you, you stay diligent, stay focused. There are no answers. There's no book with all the answers on success. It's just, you know, stay, look at things that have a profit margin. That's why real estate's such a good thing. Real estate's a good hidden equity. I got involved in, as a broker, I got involved with what's called New Mexico Council of Exchangers. And I've met some wonderful people in there. They, as far as real estate, I would say I had more of an education with those guys oh, yeah. than, than ever. And to this day, they were, they're very close friends. And, and the, the fact that you can, you know, trade, <clears throat> trade in and out of things like 1031 into this and that and have cash flow and create equity and see all these things. But, um, Anyway, it's just, it's a long, long time going and making it happen. But yeah, we, I, I would say that we're, we're happier, not so much because of the money, but, but money's good because without it, you, it it's not fun. You got to make money. It's horrible. But, but sitting around hoping it's going to hit you is not the way. Or maybe trying a lottery. So that's not the way. Or, you know? or, or what I see a lot today is, is someone else's responsibility to take care of me. Oh, yeah. That's, and that's, that's a trap absolute trap. Talk about that. Yeah. Well, you, you have, if you're lucky, 70, 80 years on this planet. And it's your responsibility what happens to you, especially after you're, you know, 10, 12 years old. With me, as right at about the ripe old age of 13 or 14. But, so I started early. But, you know, most people, it's, you know, 18, 19 years old, you're starting on your own. And you got to realize it's not anybody else's fault what happens to you. Whatever decisions you make right this minute and how you interact with people and how you portray and the, the conscious or subconscious effort of how you interact and how they interact back to you is going to be a function of how you treated them. And, so, and what you put in front of your path is this is what I want to achieve. And, and so um, the, the decisions you make today make tomorrow happen. So the better tomorrow is going to be how you live today. Christ and, and his kind of path forward for living is just a good ancient guidebook. And, and it plus the spiritual aspect of it, of having that spirit within you helping guide you. All, <laughs> all these things matter. All oh, big time. You know, they're all, yeah, they're, they're all part of life. And they make every moment that much happier. So, uh, you know, not to say everything's, you know, roses the whole time, but but uh, 
at least you learn the ways to manage through those times that aren't roses, you know. So you basically everything that you touched turned to gold. Oh no, not everything. At the, at that point, right before two thousand and eight. Oh yeah. Right. That yeah. was you were you were hitting on all cylinders. Everything that you were buying was working. You were subdividing. You were flipping. You had it going on, and then this terrible stuff happens. Yeah. And you're broke. Yep. And how can you look at that now versus how you felt when you were in that moment? Well, fortunately, I'd been broke before. <laughs> so, <laughs> been there, done that. Yeah, so I knew not to get myself in a in too precarious of a position that I was like 15 days from completely going under. You know, like you live within your means. I don't care where you are. Even to this day, Pam and I still share meals. We don't spend wild. We share meals. We tithe at church. You know, we just, uh, I, wouldn't, I think I bought, oh, I had a cash for clunkers truck. I traded my truck in for a Camry. That's the only new car I've ever bought. So I still won't go out crazy and do stuff. I mean, even if we have money, I won't do it. So that's just, and, and the other thing is, you know, you know, you realize that you help other people and, uh, it, that does more for your soul than just about anything, I think. Just helping. I help a lot of the kids at the church, as you well know. Not financially, but just uh, even not at the church. Just kids. and every, any, any time you can offer a hand, you just do it. So I don't know. That's, that's, that's some of the little keys right there, I guess. Yeah. What you put out in life always comes back to you. Yes. Always right. does. So, so you went through an awful lot there. And you said a lot, and you said everything was self-taught. Mm -hmm. And you also said that Joe and Ivina really taught you a lot. Well, they they introduced me to uh, the love of Christ, the, the uh, Joe and Ivina, and a gal named Gail Yurout, um, which was Kevin Yurout and Brian Yurout's mother, and she. I'll never forget, she she picked me up one time. And there was Barbara Proctor was driving around in a pickup, dressed as a clown, <laughs> handing out VBS pamphlets. And they said, you want to get back and help Barbara hand those out? And I thought, well, just any time you can stand next to Barbara Miller, it's Barbara Proctor now, I'll do anything. So <laughs> anyway, I got in the truck and handed them out. And then did that lasted a little while. And then she went on. I had to go on my way. But anyway... Um, she, had, she handed them out, and I got out of the back of the truck. But then they, then another, then they came and picked me up every day at our house to take me to the VBS. And, and just learning that, just learning that. So, yeah, there, that was a little, you know, that was that person mm -hmm. taking upon herself to help, you know, somebody understand that. And, and, uh, and then Joe and Ivina, you know, yeah, they, they just show the love. So, yeah, those, those were real key moments they, they really are and that's what i want to get across to to people is you can make a powerful impact on 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 anyone of any age but especially of a child if, if you'll just look them in the eyes and give them some love and give them some attention and some respect like they're yeah. like they're you know not some kid that's bugging you yep right absolutely so. yeah because they they're looking for it but they also you know a child's going to look at somebody that has, they don't care about wealth. They just care about respectability. They care about, um, you know, how, what, what is this person sincere? Is this person genuine? You know, kids could see through that stuff. Oh, yeah. And so, um, and adults too. We're all kids really, but <laughs> we, we can see through, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, we are all kids. So one of the things that, that you taught me that helped me so much um, was... To take vacations. Oh, yeah. Why is it so important to take vacations? Well, so uh, for me, um, I got a, my motto is you work hard and play harder. And um, one of the reasons I like the, being self-employed is because I decide when I want to go somewhere. I don't, I don't, I like to go, like we're always home on the 4th, we're always home on Thanksgiving, we're always home at Christmas for the most part. And because I don't want to fight the crowds, but we can go anytime we want other, outside of that. 
And, you know, it's cheaper, funner, nicer. It's don't have to spend the extra money that they require. So, um, but when you, when you undo your brain from, uh, you know, it, you've got to have a serious focus to get ahead on anything. And serious work, you, you desire just to do that. And you got to put it on your shoulders. Well, that part about undoing your head from the work and stress uh, is, is very, very important. Like you can take so much stress just being quiet and smiling when people are coming down on you. And that's just internal stress. Well, I mean, for me, I think it takes exercise, vitamin B, good vitamins, good dinners, you know, good eating, you know, sleep, all those things. And for me, that, you know, the vacations undo it. Plus, you know, you don't want to live just to work. There's got to be other things in life. There is so many cool things in life. You got to check them out, you know. And um, so I, th- yeah, I think I think the vacation part, and most of the people that I know, you know, they get to that point too. It's like, you know, they, they, they prize that time, that, that, that self time. You have you have definitely converted me. I am, <laughs> I am. Yeah, you have. And to. how and how have you done since you started? It's exploded. Yeah, it's exploded in every way. You yeah. know, the marriage is better, the family life is better, the business is better. Everything it it literally works. And I know I was. I mean, of course, he had to tempt me. Right, we're, we're out at dinner. He says, "You know what you need? You need to go sailing with us, with Pam and I." And I'm like, "You're right. That's what well, I need." I right. And so they took us down to their boat, and we went sailing. And and ever since then, I watched you do a deal on your sailboat with somebody in Australia, and I thought, "What am I doing?" <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. So it's it, it is very important, and I value it incredibly highly, I, very much. And I thank you so much for it. What what piece of advice? What books do you recommend? What what somebody who has grown up, guys? I'm not going to go into any detail, but but we've been friends for a long time. And I, there are probably, these are my numbers, these are my, my hypothesis. If he was to tell you his story of, of his life, probably 60% of you would be absolutely horrified. Um, 20% of you would be like, I get it, I'm right there. And 20% of you would be like, Psh, that was nothing, man. You, you had nothing compared, right? So he had a really rough, rough life, a rough bringing up. What would you say to somebody who has that and says, there's no way, I, I'm not worthy? How did you get over the not feeling worthy to? Well, if you don't, when, you, when you're like that, and you, those, those kinds of, you're surrounded with that, you think, uh, you, you, you think of yourself as less. So you, you automatically don't expect any more, and you'll, you're, you you so for whatever reason, you just think of yourself as less, and um, and and the and loving and love with other you know, the love you share with other people in the relationships, you know you realize that that is probably the the key to life. That is the big the biggest part of life, and so for me it was when I honest to God, it was it was when I got saved. I was fourteen years old. And it suddenly opened up. I thought, if if I can, if, if God is the one, if all you got to do, and I can't remember where the verse is, but if somehow it just pleased me and everything else is good. Well, I thought, I, I mean, if there's just one guy to please, and he's the creator of the universe, and that's all I got to do is please him. I don't care if it goes good or bad or whatever. I'm just going to work that way. So, and I did. I remember going to high school, and my dad had died, so I was literally on the, on my own, living in garages, you know, all, all over the place, friends' houses, whatever, couches. And uh, I had this book of Proverbs and this New Testament. And I remember the book of Proverbs uh, had so many, uh, like, verses, like, young men, you know, think that on these terms and such and such. You know, just, I can't remember any of them. I mean, if I opened it up, there's just hundreds of them. Chapter 4. Yeah, and so I mean, I really use that book of Proverbs uh, as a tool of just life. I would just read it, and uh, so I would say that that caused my own mind to be set apart. And at the time, you know, you're going through those years, and there's so much craziness going on. You don't know that that's a good way and a right way to go forward. You just do it because you're surviving. So for me. 
getting my head straightened out was the most important thing mm -hmm. and and recognizing who am i going to follow well yeah you recommended a book to me several years ago and i think i've read it twenty eight thousand times um <laughs> uh switch on your brain oh that's a dandy that's a dandy so what is it about that book that made you i know you've read it a lot too oh, yeah. what what is it about that book that's that like what stands out what are what are just a couple things you can tell people that you learned from that well carolyn leaf is a you know she's i, I don't know if she's a neurosurgeon or a psychologist scientist. or scientist neuro kind, neuro yeah. neuropsychologist neuroscientist neuroscientist okay she wrote this book and she's a, a christian woman but you know, I, I, like I said, I like the science of things. At least got to make sense to me. Mm -hmm. So the cool thing about that book is she brings back uh, real, real life examples of people and their brains and their thoughts and applies them to different times in the Bible. And here's what God says about it. And here's what God says about it. You know, the Bible's that thick. <laughs> so it's got a lot of words. <laughs> so, but she applies verses back to it. Uh, you know, one in particular that, that gets me is that, you know, she says, well, they had done a study and there was two, tw there was a set of twins and they're both in different rooms. And she said, twins especially have some kind of a, uh, an ability to, to, to feel each other's feelings, even when they're not in the same room. So they did something to one twin and the other twin felt this. And she said, um, realistically, there is another plane that we live in and another dimension mathematically yes there's another dimension but the all we see is three right now so there's 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 other dimensions so she said yeah there's another dimension and your thoughts are extremely important and how you think because uh and then and then she talked about um she talked about how god also recognized that in many many different verses in the bible new testament old testament how your thinking applies to what's going on, and others. So your thoughts, your words, what you ingest, all these things make a huge difference on the kind of person you are and the kind of person you personify and the way you're treated by others. Right. So it, it others will treat you successful, whether you're successful or not, because you're, you're, you're switched on, your brain is switched on. In that, and so I, I would say what that Carolyn Leaf. That's what that's what she she takes it right back to the Bible, and she and she does it in a good, good way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's all very 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 scientific. So yeah. Any last words of wisdom for somebody who is where they don't really want to be, and they want to be somewhere else, and they just don't know the, the first step. Um. Yeah, the, 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 the first step is recognizing within yourself that there is a problem first. It's trying to, trying to unravel it, you know, break it apart. Mm -hmm. If you can't unravel it, break it apart. Go get, go get help and figure out how it can be. You know, big problems can be broken up in little problems. The little problems can be solved. Big ones can't. They just overwhelm. Just like a, a tail, chasing a tail. Mm -hmm. You can't get out of it. Right. So I would say that for me, try to under to telling somebody try to understand what that is. Uh, go go back to the get your heart right with. For me, it's been get your heart right with Christ. Get 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 yourself saved is the bottom line. Have that supernatural uh, knowledge base allowed to be imprinted on your soul too. Um, get that right first. If if you don't do anything else, get that right, and then. As far as success, uh, financial success, hard work, understand that financial success is probably low on the totem pole. You know, the relationships, how you treat, how you interact, that's high. Live within your means. Get yourself a goal. Get a goal that's achievable and break your life apart into, okay, here's what I'm going to do in like th this hour then. This is what I'm going to do in this four hours. This is what I'm going to do in this eight. This is what's going to be done in this week. This is what's going to be done in a month. This is what's going to be done in a year. And give yourself goals. And the stuff that you do daily, daily stuff is more like get your head right. You know, enjoy life. Learn how to appreciate it and enjoy it. And then start in on all these other adventures is what they really are, adventures. 
So you said that relationships are the most important. Mm -hmm. How important, if when you to make them the most important, right? You, well, give, Christ, you give Christ, them most of Christ your time. First, Christ first, Christ first, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, then your relationships is everything else, right? It's, yep. it's your relationship with Christ and then your relationship with others. Mm -hmm. And how important have those relationships been in, your, in the success you enjoy today? Well, to honest, honestly, who doesn't get a whole lot of credit is my wife. And she is like the little quiet girl that... Um, she's not really that quiet that often. <laughs> we but, love you, Pam. But she's... Uh, <laughs> But she's not like throw her, you know, she's never tries to put herself out in front of anybody. She's the most giving person I know. And I would say that, uh, especially like with all the, with the kids or just me living day to day and growing, you know, interactive talking to somebody, it's been her for me. So I would say that, that my hard work and ignorance and her um, genuineness and and her godliness has probably been the secret to where we are today. You know, it's the second time. I, the, I don't even know if you'll remember this, but Dan and I were in a movie together. Do you remember that? Which, which, oh, I don't gosh. even remember. That's 25 years ago, Carol. <laughs> it's, it's been a minute. Oh, it, yeah. It's been a minute. But I remember we were, we were on this movie set, and you were intently talking to me about how you wished that you had the relationship with the Lord that your wife does because it was just, she just, you can just. Oh, yeah. <sighs> well, and then later on you find out that, you know, even, you know, the Bible talks about a godly woman is being, you, you know, probably the, the best thing that you can have as a man for a wife, is a godly woman. And now, by golly, that's the truth. You got one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. for sure. Good job. Yeah. I'm uh, that's a blessing again ignorance on my part i did did nothing to deserve any of that so <laughs> I hear you. well dan thank you so much for your time thank oh, you for Kara, sharing good, with good us seeing you all right Thanks guys thank you